Just be glad for all you have that's in today. Hey everyone, Connie here, and welcome to my blind reaction to Ruby Volume 6, Chapter 12. Uh, so yeah, we're pretty much at the end of the uh, season here. Um, and we've still got two big fights going on. Um, we're in the middle of the fight uh, between Caroline Cordovan and most of our team. <laughs> They're all working to take her on still, and last we left off, she had caught a missile that Maria had launched from the ship at her, and then threw it back at the ship. And Ruby's hanging from the cliff uh, with Crescent Rose, and so things aren't looking good for them at the moment. Uh, but we also saw Blake and Adam, or, or Blake and Adam, Blake and Yang taking on Adam. We found out uh, that Adam has a brand on his eye, on his left eye, from the Schnee Dust Company. The same Schnee Dust Company that um, that Jacques is insisting on uh, treating its Faunus employees with equality. Yet apparently, they at least at some point, were very hostile towards them, enough to brand one of them. Presumably, I mean, I can only guess at this moment, nothing's been confirmed, but presumably Adam worked for the Schnee Dust Company as a faunus worker, and I would guess that for whatever reason, they branded him. I don't know why, I don't know, like, what could have led to that, but for some reason they did, and that's what caused his extreme hatred of humanity. And I mean, it's probably more than just the branding. Probably just the Schnee Dust Company in general. Which would also allow for more building on Weiss's character. For if, if she finds out about this, finds out about how her father and her father's company has been treating the Faunus, like, that's... She's not gonna put up with that. The, and, and it's... It's funny, because at the very beginning of the series, in Season 1, she held these uh, anti-Faunus prejudices. We saw that in Season 1 with Blake, and Sun, as well. She held these prejudices towards the Faunus, because we know now that that's how she was raised, and she really didn't know anything else. But as she became more and more in tune with, well, her friends, getting to know a Faunus directly, as well as just seeing how her friends treated them, and uh, seeing the treatment of others like Velvet at uh, Beacon, it allowed her to grow much more. As well as, of course, having to go back to her father after the fall of Beacon, and having to suffer that abuse after having come so far, allowed her to really have her eyes opened about it. We saw how she really didn't like when Cordovan showed racism towards Blake. So we know that if she finds out about this, like, I mean, she already knows her father and, her, and, and the company are kind of messed up. She does. But I don't think she knows that they're this messed up. And I think that if she finds out it's going to really affect her. And I think it could lead to some of her best character development yet. Which, I mean, is, all, is saying something because we've already had phenomenal character development for her. It's one of the biggest reasons why she's my favorite character. Um, but beyond that, we also uh, find out, like, we have confirmation on what Adam's semblance is. It's basically just like Yang's. He can absorb power and deal it back, except unlike Yang... He can just take it to his sword. He doesn't need to take it to his body. He doesn't need to feel the pain, as Yang puts, as Yang puts it. Yeah. I don't know. When I said that, it's like I'm like, did I rhyme Yang with pain? And it's like, I don't know. It just threw me off for a second. It's like, <laughs> um. But we see Yang come to Blake's rescue. She uh, launches Bumblebee into uh, Adam's face, basically, knocking him back. Thank thankfully, he has aura, because that should have killed him. I mean, that would have killed a normal person. 
Um, and, and then it's basically at the end, it's like Blake's like, oh no, she's not protecting me and I'm not protecting her. We're protecting each other. And I mentioned in my afterthoughts last time that there is no other way that could be read other than confirming their ship. Especially with the fact that in order to save Blake, Yang had to throw away her motorcycle. She had to throw away Bumblebee to confirm Bumblebee. I mean, there is literally no other way that could be read. I've heard some people uh, try to say, like, oh, no, 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 they're just, they're just friends. This is... They're they're not acting anything like uh, lovers or anything. There this is this, there's nothing here but best friends. And it's like, are you stupid? I'm sorry, but there is. I've had many best friends, and I've never acted that way uh, to them. I mean, sure, best friends can save each other and everything, and that's all well and good. And you can make the argument about uh, Weiss and Ruby's interactions in last episode being more of best friends. Um, but with this, no. The, it, the argument falls apart on every level. One, there's been so much uh, just stuff building up to this. I mean, they have a freaking song, a love song called Bumblebee. That is very clearly not about the bike. <laughs> they've been building up to this, but they've been being subtle about it. They're not throwing it in your face. And here's the funny thing. I compared it to The Legend of Korra, and I stand by that. And the thing is, people doubted The Legend of Korra thing, too. So many people uh, at the end of the series, when uh, Asami and Korra held hands and uh, walked into the spirit portal together after looking lovingly into each other's eyes, people were uh, saying, oh, no, 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 this isn't confirming anything. They're just best friends. They're just going on a vacation together. It's just a nice moment after so much uh, heavy uh, stuff going on with Kuvira and whatnot. It's like, are you, really? How do people believe this? And then Michael and Brian had to come out and say, oh, no, no, Korra and Asami are together. And in the comics, which are considered canon to the series, they just straight up call themselves girlfriends. So, um, and make a big point about how they're together. And I just feel like they're, it, it's clearly the same kind of buildup here. Just like with Korra and Asami, there was so much uh, context, uh, background context and stuff, and, and various things here and there that was, was clearly telling us in seasons past that this was not just some uh, random cute ship that the fans liked, that there was actually something to this. It's been going on almost the entire series. And now this one moment all but says that they're together. Like I said, it can't be read any other way. It just can't. Uh, even the closest of friends don't act like that. Um... <laughs> It'd be like, oh, we're best friends, but we're going to hold hands and cuddle and and, uh, and stare lovingly into each other's eyes and shit. And it's like, seriously? And again, there can be, there is a such thing as uh, non-romantic and non-sexual cuddling. Of course, cuddling's not only romantic and sexual. You can cuddle with friends or even family members. Or I cuddle with a dog. <laughs> um, but still, just everything together... All of the context clues, it's like anyone at this point who's denying it is is just that. They're in denial. It's so obvious. It's so blatant. They're not even hiding it. Like in the in the most recent Ruby Rewind, Rewind even, I, I didn't watch all of it, but I watched the part where Barb came in and uh, talked about it. Um, she was even, she was trying to be coy, but honestly, it was super obvious and, and they showed a little Skype call moment from Aaron Zek, and even she was uh, talking about how she supported the ship and all. It's like, it's super obvious. At, at this point, anyone who's still trying to say uh, that they're acting like best friends is just fooling themselves. 
And I bet you anything that this episode's going to have something even more in it. I bet you anything it's going to have uh, even more confirmation. Uh, and again, I don't necessarily think they have to, like, straight up kiss or anything. But, like, staring lovingly into each other's eyes, the dialogue could do it. Um, all sorts of ways they could handle it. Um, but they do need to deal with Adam first. And I, I wonder how this is going to end up going. Because there's really only three ways to handle this. Either they just straight up defeat him and, I guess, leave him there. They defeat him and, uh, like, okay, four ways. They defeat him and leave him there. They defeat him and, like, tie him up or something and bring him with them um, in order so he can get justice and everything. Which would probably seem more likely than them just leaving him there. Um, third option, they kill him, which I wouldn't say it's unlikely because I, I could see them having to maybe take that route or maybe having, like, literally no other option. But I think that's one of the less likely options. Or the fourth option is uh, simply that he win. He's, like, winning, and they have to end up just running away. And he ends up escaping because he knows that he can't handle everyone at once. Those are the only four options I really can see. Um, and again... To different levels. I think, honestly, the most likely is that they do defeat him, but that um, they end up, like, again, tying him up or just binding him in some way and taking him with them. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. I just don't see them leaving him there because at that point they'd be, like, just asking for him to come back and hunt them down again. And at that point he'd be even angrier and be even more vindictive against them. So it's just like, yeah. Uh, and also, to mention, um, it hasn't still explicitly stated that he and Blake used to be a couple. It's very heavily uh, hinted at, and it's definitely obvious. Just like with uh, Bumblebee being canon, it's super obvious. It's not really even hiding it, especially with the dialogue he had towards Blake in the last episode. Um, but it hasn't actually stated it. So I'm wondering if they're going to, or if, like uh, other stuff, they're going to try to just um, kind of keep it more subtle and make it just super obvious without actually needing to, like, tell us. You know, kind of a show-don't-tell thing. And th that's what they're doing with Bumblebee, going back to that. Um, a lot of people... A lot of these same people who are like, oh, they haven't actually explicitly said anything, so we can't just assume... Um, a lot of them are the same ones who say, who, uh, always advocate for show, don't tell in cartoons or shows in general, movies, games. Oh, you have to show, you can't just tell everybody everything. You can't just, um, uh, force, you can't just like, uh, what's the word for it? There's a word for it. Not monologue. That's definitely wrong. But you can't, it, it's just like that. You can't just tell everybody every little detail you have to allow the audience to be able to figure things out on their own you have to show them what's going on and not just tell them everything that's happening so it's like again there's a word for that i just can't think of it um but yeah and, and it's it's like that's exactly what they're doing with bumblebee that's what they did with cora and asami but they the only reason michael and uh and uh now his name's escaping. Brian had to uh, say something is because so many uh, fans were trying to deny it still. It's like, okay, you, you people need to stop. It's canon. It's a thing. Deal with it. <laughs> it's basically what they had to come out and do. And it's like, I, I don't know if Rooster Teeth would do the same thing here. Um, I, I still think, I mean, again, from the Ruby Rewind, they're still trying to be coy. They're trying to keep it a little more... Uh, I, I guess subjective would be a way to put it. But, you know, it's, again, it's stupidly obvious, and there's really no other way to interpret how this is, how everything connects. I'm sorry, there isn't. Um, and, and again, I truly believe that this episode will go even further with it. I bet you anything that something in this episode, I don't know what, but 
either during the continued battle against Adam or after or whatever, there's going to be a moment that even further confirms Bumblebee as a ship. But either way, um, we've been talking uh, for about 15 minutes now. Uh, I do want to just get to this reaction. Um, I am recording this back on Monday. You're still seeing this on Saturday, of course. So that's why I may seem like I'm a little stuffed up and everything because I'm sick at this point. Um, it's a very, very light cold. Um, just a very minor sore throat, uh, a little bit of a stuffy nose. That's pretty much it. Don't even really have a headache. Um, but yeah, it's nothing to worry about. So <laughs> hopefully it stays that way. Um, either way, so yeah, just letting you know about that ahead of time as well. Uh, either way, we're going to get started. So when the screen fades to black, pause this redirect and go to the description below. Follow the link to the reaction, and after you watch it, come back here to the redirect and resume play. Because after it fades to black and then fades back in, everything from that point forward will be my afterthoughts. And will contain spoilers to the episode. So that being said, thank you so much for tuning in, and I will see you at the reaction. Okay, and we are back, and we'll begin with spoilers in 3, 2, 1, now. Um, so before anything, I do want to discuss uh, what I was talking about with Adam. I, I mentioned in the reaction that there was one other thing I wanted to mention with him. Um, let me just raise the lighting on this because it's gotten dark in here. So let me just raise that a little bit. I mean, it doesn't really help that much, but it's something. Um, okay, so I've seen a lot of people talking about Adam. I'm part of this Ruby group on Facebook. And so I, see, I do get to see a lot of the uh, discussion regarding uh, recently released episodes. Um, and they've been talking about how Adam, how they feel, and it's not been everyone, it's just been a few people, how they feel that Adam has been nerfed. How the Adam from seasons one through three would never have been, uh, would never have lost at Haven, in the, especially in the way that he did. And that he would have never uh, been over uh, overtaken by Yang and Blake during this battle. And keep in mind, th this this commentary was only referring to like where it left off with the last episode, so it wasn't uh, getting into the stuff with this one. Um, and, and that's completely false. See, here's the thing that a lot of them don't take into account with Haven specifically, Adam was emotional he was overly emotional and he was losing his cool and i don't care who you are but when you start to get overly emotional and lose your cool your reasoning ability and your ability to fight will go down because you're not clear-headed enough to be able to make uh rational decisions on a moment's notice you'll end up acting out and making honestly stupid mistakes which is what happened with Adam at Haven. He was overcome with everything that was going on and it allowed Blake to take uh, action at that moment and take him down. And in this battle, he was extremely emotional about it. He's been honestly kind of losing his mind in the past volumes. Uh, so especially after being uh, defeated at Haven and losing control of the White Fang. So... He's definitely not at his best here. That doesn't mean he's not strong. That doesn't mean he's not capable. It just means he's not at his best. If he were at his best, would he have defeated Yang and Blake here? Possibly. I will not deny that. But the thing, the difference here is Yang and Blake were at their best. Yes, they got emotional at points, but they were still keeping composed throughout the majority of the battle. Uh, even though Yang was still suffering from her PTSD, and we clearly saw that with the shaking of her hands and everything, it was also clear that she was keeping composed about what she needed to do. And, I mean, the fact that she trusted Blake to get out of that situation herself. She didn't run to try and save Blake. She continued fighting Adam because she trusted Blake to get, be able to get out of that, and she was right in doing so. She had to focus on what was going on at the time being. And old Yang, pre-volume 4 Yang, would not have been able to do that. Pre-volume 4, Yang was a lot more hot-headed and uh, took a lot more risky chances. She would have easily rushed towards Blake. 
and probably have gotten killed because of it. But the but she made a choice and, and she thought rationally and she knew Blake would be of all people would be able to get out of that situation. And so she took advantage of the situation and continued to fight against Adam, which in the end allowed her and Blake to team up to take him down. Um, I love how that how they both finished him off together. Um, there were people saying that they think that uh, Adam should be defeated once and for all by Blake specifically, that Yang shouldn't be the one to deal a final blow, because it's much more of Blake's uh, storyline that she's... Uh, that it's much more personal to her. And maybe, maybe. But the thing is, Yang, ever since uh, she lost her arm to Adam in Volume 3, has been just as tied up in the story she was forced into this plot line and ever since she's been an integral part of it i knew since that moment that adam wasn't going to go down for good unless it was both blake and yang taking him out together and with last episode especially that honestly very much cemented it that they were not with the entire um i've I'm going to protect her and she's going to protect me. We're going to protect each other thing. Um, with that entire line, uh, oh, actually it was more like, I'm not going to protect her. She's not going to protect me. We're going to protect each other. Um, with that entire line, though, um, honestly, it pretty much confirmed that uh, they were both going to have to take him down. That it couldn't just be one of them. Because honestly, I believe that one of them alone would, would not be strong enough. Again, even though he wasn't at his best, I think that Adam was still too strong for either of them to take him out alone. And again, if he was at his best, I do believe that he probably would have taken them both out. He was legitimately that strong. So it's like the fans who are saying, oh, they've nerfed Adam. No, they haven't. If anything, they're proving with these past seasons how strong he truly is, especially with this fight, by having him able to match them so consistently, to be able to give them this big of a fight, in this kind of circumstance, with him not at his mental or physical best, you think that that's nerfing him? Not a chance. Um, but yeah, I, I did just want to bring that up first and foremost. Um, but yeah, let's go further into just that entire scene. We're going to talk about that part first. So, Yang and Blake work together and kill Adam. That I did not expect. Uh, I mean, again, it was one of my, uh, like, four ideas of how this fight was going to end. It was one of the way, only ways I honestly saw it going to end. One of the four ways. But honestly, it wasn't my most expected to happen. Um, like I said, I, I didn't think it was impossible. I didn't think that it, that they would even have to uh, avoid it if they had to do it. But I don't know. I just saw them defeating him, capturing him more likely. I'm actually really surprised that they did end up killing him off. But again, I'm not disappointed because it's believable. I don't think they really had any other options. Could they have possibly knocked him out and bound him? Maybe. But honestly, at this point, I just think that they had to put an end to it. And they realized that. They realized that he would he could probably come back if or, or even escape his binding somehow if they just tried to do something like that. So they impaled him from both sides. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's very clear he's dead. Again, if they try to bring him back at this point, it's going to be another Salem situation. Or have I Did I say Salem before as well? Another Cinder situation. I think I said Salem before as well. Oh my goodness. It would be another Cinder situation where a character clearly dies where all the context is saying that they're dead and then they're brought back. Although with this, it would be even worse than with Cinder. Because admittedly, with Cinder, she didn't have any huge 
like massive outer wound or outer or inner wounds or anything. With Adam, he was impaled from two sides and dropped into a river. There, there's no way he's going to survive that. And, and dropped into a river, which is probably freezing because of the uh, clear climate that they're in right now. So he's more than likely going to freeze to death in the river uh, on top of bleeding out from his wounds or just, you know, the internal damage from that. So, yeah, it's just like, I did not expect that. But again, I'm not disappointed. I think it was honestly a smart move. Plus, now we can actually move past him, and Blake and Yang can both uh, move past that for their story together. Um, they're clearly going to still be bound together in terms of their story, because uh, we clearly had them their, uh, their little uh, talk afterwards, uh, basically stating, like, oh, they're never leaving each other's side again. And, yeah, that's a good thing. That's what we want to see. Um, and, again, going to that, the way they embraced each other, the way Yang put her head against Blake's and everything, the dialogue itself, I said it in my pre-thoughts. I, I said that I was confident they were going to confirm it even further about Bumblebee being canon, again, without explicitly stating it. This is the perfect example of show, don't tell. In fact, here's a fun thing I can actually say here. This was better handled than Korra. That might be hard to believe. Korra is still my favorite show of all time. But honestly, Bumblebee was better handled than Korra. Korra and Asami did have some buildup. And I hate when fans say, like, oh, it just came out of nowhere at the end of the series. No, it didn't. If you were paying attention, especially during volumes three and four, it did not come out of nowhere. Um, but even with that, it, it was still less, uh, less so built up than this. Bumblebee was just insanely built up through context clues and various, uh, noteworthy bits of dialogue and nonverbal communication. It was so obvious from so early on, and that's why so many people latch onto this. And especially with these past episodes, why so many people are, like, pointing out how obvious it is. Like, with last episode especially. It's like, again, you cannot see these as just best friends. These are not the interactions and dialogue and nonverbal cues that best friends would have. I'm sorry. Bullshit. That is bullshit. It's not debatable in my eyes. It is not even slightly debatable. Just like it wasn't when they did it with Nora and Ren at the end of Volume 4. When Ren grabbed her hand and she leaned into his shoulder. People did actually try to deny that when that happened too, funny enough. Because uh, there were people who were saying like, oh no, because she did the same thing with Sean. She leaned on Sean's shoulder um, afterwards at the end of the episode and everything. It's like, yes, she did, but... Can you read the context clues at all? The way he grabbed her hand, her reaction to it, the music that was playing, everything was obvious about that. And, I mean, that was confirmed last episode when she said, come back here with my man. Like, honestly, you cannot deny that. I mean, that one explicitly told us. But again, at th by this point, it was already obvious. Um... With Blake and Yang, yes, it was already obvious by this point, too, especially uh, with this season. But it just became, like, undeniable. There is no possible way you can view it any other way. I'm sorry. And if you think that, like, that wouldn't have been, oh, that's not Mo that wasn't Monty's plan, that goes against Monty's... Uh, plans and everything. It's like, uh, again, someone mentioned it last time or the time before or something like that, and one of my other ones said, like, uh, oh, plans change. Character dynamics change as shows go on. A and that's true. And it's like, so it's like, I think it was Cartoon Lounge. I think it was you who said that. Um, but it's like, 
maybe Monty did see them more as sisters when he was helming the show. But you don't know how it would have evolved with him if he hadn't passed away, unfortunately. All we know now is that um, with Miles and Carrie in charge, they chose to take the step. They have shown previous support for the LGBT community through Ilya, as well as Saffron and Tara. And now they're clearly showing it with these two. And honestly, it, honestly, I am hoping that, that, that in the future they show more than just uh, girl-on-girl things, uh, if I'm being honest, because the LGBT community is much more than that. Um, show some gay guys. I mean, that would be pretty awesome. Or have someone who may, maybe is asexual or aromantic or both. That could be interesting, too. Either way, the point I'm trying to make with it is that they are still going heavily into this, and that's a good thing. And they're making it come across as natural, and it never comes across as forced, in my eyes at least. It always feels very natural to the world and to the characters. It, They don't try to, like, shove it in your face or, uh, or down your throat or anything like that. Um, but let's talk about the other half of this episode. So, we had the continued fight against Cordovan, and she's gotten the upper hand. She even manages to knock the ship out of the air. Though, at the end, it does seem the ship is able to get back up. It seems like it wasn't that badly damaged, that uh, it, it won't be able to fly again. Um, but in order to stop her, Ruby decides, like, you know what, I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to take a risky move and go for it. Crow tries to stop her, but she assures him, just trust me. And she makes her move. She flies into the cannon and explodes the dust inside of it. She escapes, gets a little shaken up, but escapes. Perfectly fine. And the dust explodes all around the cannon and causes just the cannon to be, be weighed down and pre pretty much useless. In all ways, they defeated Cordovan there. Like, there's really no way to stop her at this point. Or no way for her to stop them. However, at that moment, we find out that the base has been trying to get in contact with Cordovan. Because there is a giant kaiju-like grim coming towards Argus. And I, I, I said it was like Godzilla-like. And um, it, it's design-wise, it's really not that much. But that's just instantly what it reminded me of. Um, it's, it it kind of looks a little reptilian, um, but it's not quite Godzilla-like. But we see it heading towards Argus, and we also see a bunch of other Grimm coming as well. Like, just just horde of Grimm. And it's just like, and we see Cordovan's reaction. She's, like, freaked out. She's horrified. And, and it goes back to what I was saying during the reaction. She's not a bad per. Well, she's not... Whole, a wholly bad person. She's not entirely evil. She's conceited. She's um, bigoted. And she has a terrible sense of priority. But she does truly want to protect the people of Argus. She clearly isn't like ho just this horrible evil being. And I like that. I like that she's more she definitely has some moral problems. But she's not 100% evil. And she shows that, uh, just in that one reaction, that she does care. And that she is afraid for the people of Argus. So here's how I think this is going to end up. Uh, our heroes are going to have to free her. And they're going to all have to work together to take out these Grimm. There's no other way. Um, Yang and Blake are going to have to come and join in. And everybody's going to have to work together to take out the Grimm. Otherwise, I don't see how they could win this. And here's the thing. This entire uh, ending battle stuff really lasted longer than I thought. Because I, I thought it was going to end with them already on their way to Atlas and all. But no. Like, I, I think episode 13 is the final episode, right? And it's just like... Hold on, let me check. I actually can check that just by knowing the date. 
Yeah, because it comes out on the 26th. Or, well, technic... Oh, wait, no, no, no. Okay, there's 14 episodes then. Because the last episode comes out on Rooster Teeth first on the 26th. This episode came out on Rooster Teeth... Wait, no, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> this episode came out on the 19th, on Rooster Teeth first. It's coming out to everyone on the 26th. So, yeah, okay. The episode that's coming this Saturday to Rooster Teeth first is going to be the final episode. Um, it's also the day that apparent that other new show that Gen that Gen X or Gen X or whatever it's called is coming uh, as well. I'm not interested in that, by the way. I'm not going to be reacting to it. Just saying, I have no interest in it. Uh, not even with some pretty big name uh, VOs in it or v VAs rather. Um, but yeah, it's just like there's one episode left. And it's like, they're going to have to defeat all of these Grimm and presumably be on their way to Atlas in this time. Plus, I assume we're going to at least check in one more time with the bad guys. Whether it be Mercury and Emerald, or it be Tyrion and Watts, or maybe even Salem. I also theorized in the past that o uh, Ozpin would return by the end of the volume, but honestly, at this point, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't know. Um, it'll probably happen next volume, and I'm really, really hoping that when it does, um, our heroes will have learned how wrong they were about him, how much they need him, and how there's really no reason to hate him. Because, again, I'm not over that. No one has been able to give a proper refutation to my belief that Ozpin is innocent in all of this. I I'm sorry, but Ozpin is innocent. The only thing he did wrong was lie about it all and hide it all, but that's not that big of a deal. Not when what's going on is going on. Not in the grand scheme of things. Uh... So yeah, either way, um, this episode was really, really freaking good. Not only further just cementing that Bumblebee is canon. I mean, again, there is literally no other way to interpret it. Not only further cementing that, but also just in general, um, uh, just being really well written. Doing some really surprising things and... Uh, ending off on a great cliffhanger that's going to lead into our final episode. Hard to believe it's already uh, coming to an end. And that may have you wondering about, is there is something going to replace Ruby in the time slot uh, for Saturdays, joining in with uh, JoJo? And um, it's been something I've been thinking about, and I do want to address it here. I know these afterthoughts have been pretty long already, but I do want to address this. It has been something I've been thinking about because although I tend to a lot of times get behind on uh, weekend stuff, um, I have been questioning whether or not I want to uh, continue to do two reactions each day for the weekend. And the thing with this is that there's always a guarantee that when new anime uh, seasons come that I'll have to double up anyway no matter what. So, I'm thinking it might be better to just keep it being uh, two reactions for both Saturday and Sunday at the moment. Again, as always, anything can change. Um, so, as for what is going to replace Ruby, because um, as I mentioned, um, just to fill in the slot, uh, it's going to be the new Netflix Carmen Sandiego series. This is the official announcement uh, that I am going to be uh, filling that for Saturdays right after um, Ruby finishes, the week after that. So yeah, uh, I've already mentioned that I'm going to react to it. It's like, it shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. I have mentioned that before. But it's like, yeah, it's even more uh, cemented now. Um, it's on my list uh, for that time slot uh, for the future. Because um, I have uh, both current time slots and then what's replacing everything. 
So it's on that uh, spot to take over for Ruby. Um, and, and we'll kind of go from there. I mean, if, if we don't end up liking it, like if for some reason I don't end up liking it and end up dropping it, at that point, I don't know what's going to happen. Well, again, we'll have to see. But for now, I think this is fine. I think we'll still be able to make this work. Um, so yeah, tell me in the comments below what you thought of this episode of Ruby. Let's get back on track here for the end. Um, tell me your thoughts on Bumblebee being just obviously canon. Tell me your thoughts on the finale of the battle with Cordovan and how it's now moving into the, uh, the Grim coming towards, uh, towards the city. And also tell me your thoughts on Adam's death. Like, that was really surprising to me. Again, not like this terrible decision or anything, just I didn't actually expect it to go all the way that route. I don't know. But tell me your thoughts down in the comments below, and thank you so much for tuning in. For now, I'm Connie, and I'm signing off. See y'all next time. And though you've come through many obstacles,